Well, hello, everybody. My name is David Guzik, and I'm very pleased that you could join me here on what is, for me, a Thursday afternoon here on the West Coast of the United States. Wherever you are all around the world, I'm glad that you could join us, and I'm glad that you could be here for our Thursday afternoon question and answer time. It's a very special week for most of the Christian world. Uh, we celebrate Easter this weekend, Resurrection Sunday, and uh, tomorrow is the day commonly celebrated as Good Friday, recognizing the day on which Jesus Christ was crucified. And so it's a great honor to be able to come together with you. I'm grateful for our team. I'm grateful for our many subscribers. I'm grateful for the people who show up and make this a program. Uh, this is how it goes. I begin with a lead question. I'll get to our lead question in just a moment. And then it's to the questions that you submit on our live chat on the YouTube channel. So you just write the question in and one of our moderators will come and select it and forward it to me. And I'll just take it off the messages there and answer it there. We can't get to every single question that comes in usually on a Thursday afternoon. We do the best we can and we try to make a copy of the chat so that maybe we can get back and hit some of those questions later on. Today's lead question comes from Ella who's part of our TWR360 audience. TWR360 is Trans World Radio 360. It is a remarkable ministry uh, that for many decades has been serving in the field of shortwave radio. Bible teaching, Bible reading, uh, great messages, sermons, discipleship material over shortwave radio, and now TWR360 is their internet presence. So uh, our program is broadcast on a portal on TWR360, and Ella, one of our TWR360 audience, asks this question. Actually, it's a second part of a two-part question, but we only had time today to get to her second part. Ella's question is this. My conviction is that the scripture, by his stripes we are healed, that's Isaiah 53, verse 5, by the way. My conviction is that the scripture, by his stripes we are healed, refers to our spiritual sickness of sin, not physical sickness. To my mind, there are other scriptures which clearly teach that God can and does heal, but even from the early years of coming to faith in Lord Yeshua the Messiah, I was struck with the firm conviction that the scripture refers to spiritual healing. I know that the finished work of Jesus of his suffering and sacrifice in the arrest, trial, scourging, and other sufferers in the death on the cross is, without a shadow of doubt, sufficient for the salvation of those who, and there is no question that when a person repents and believes upon the Lord Yeshua's death and resurrection, they are saved because by his stripes we are healed. There is not the same certainty that the same person with a serious illness coming to the Lord will be necessarily healed. To believe otherwise, to my mind, brings uncertainty concerning salvation too. Have I got this completely wrong? This is really important, current issue. So I would really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Shalom and God bless. Well, Ella, thank you so much for your question. And I'm very pleased to get to it here today. And I think it's appropriate for today. Because when we talk about that great verse, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, by his stripes we are healed. Of course, that's relevant to the suffering, the passion, the agony that Jesus Christ endured for the salvation of his people, when he was arrested, when he was beaten, when he was spat upon, when he was whipped, when he was nailed to a cross, when he died that torturous death, all of that together we can consider his passion, his suffering, what he went through for his people. And because this is the week that we give a special focus to that, and we think of it all through the year, we're never far from the cross of Jesus Christ, at least that's our hope. Uh, at the same time, this is a particular week when we think about it very deeply. And so it's an entirely appropriate question for me to get to today. So let's deal with the relevant passage here. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning at verse 4, where we read this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes 
we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I think you could notice I read that kind of slowly, deliberately. Because what an amazing passage this is. In some ways, again, in some ways, even more descriptive than the gospel accounts themselves regarding what Jesus went through on the cross. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgression. Verse 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was put upon Him. Yes, Jesus Christ, God's Messiah, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And he explains why. The prophet Isaiah explains to us why. It was for us. It was for our transgressions, for our iniquities. There he is speaking in the voice of the people of God. It was in our place that the Messiah suffered, that he was wounded for our transgressions. Wounded, it's literally there, pierced through. And that's what Jesus was. Now, verse 5 of Isaiah chapter 53 also says, And by his stripes we are healed. Here, the prophet Isaiah looked down through the centuries to know that the Messiah would be beaten with many stripes. Now, what? What is it to be beaten with a stripe? Well, it's to be beaten with a whip that leaves bruises and bleeding and laceration on your back that look like ribbons, that look like stripes. You know, that was part of Jesus' suffering. A few years back, I laid a hold of somebody's attempt to make, I believe the Romans called it a flagellum, the kind of whip that Jesus would have been beaten with. And again, this is just someone's attempt But basically, you have a wooden handle, you have uh, leather straps, and you have metal. They would have used lead uh, balls at the end. I've also heard that they would embed maybe pieces of glass or bone or stone in the midst of this. Not only the metal balls that you see here. But friends, you can imagine what it would be like, what kind of whip action you could get casting this about. Man, it's just a heavy, heavy kind of thing to think of our Savior, who had done nothing wrong, who was innocent of every crime, being beaten with such an instrument and having the many stripes upon his back. Now, the prophet Isaiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit, of course, announced that provision for healing is found in the suffering of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, By his stripes, we are healed. Now, Ella asked the question, is this physical healing or is this spiritual healing? And Ella, let me just tell you, I find it fascinating as we take a look at the New Testament that there are quotations in the New Testament of this passage or at least allusions to this passage that speak of it in both senses. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, let me just focus on verse 24. It says this, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Now look, it's very clear in the context. This isn't like some big mystery. There, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he's speaking of the healing brought by the stripes of the Messiah to be spiritual in nation. It's of our sins. By the suffering of Jesus who died in our place, we are healed from the, the so-called disease of sin. That's the sense in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And if that were the only place in the New Testament where this passage was quoted or at least alluded to, maybe we would just end it there. And Ella, it kind of seems like that's kind of the direction you've wanted to go. This is speaking of something spiritual and not physical. But I want you to pay attention now to 
Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Take a look at that with me here. When evening had come, they brought him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now there, Matthew, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is clearly quoting or referring to the same passage from Isaiah chapter 53 and says it's relevant to physical healing. Because again, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, he's talking about physical healing. Now, I'm kind of comfortable with saying this, that primarily Isaiah 53, verse 5, has spiritual healing in mind, healing from sin, but it also definitely includes physical healing. Because in some way or another, all sickness, all disease, can be traced back to sin. Now, please, give me a moment here. I'm not talking about the sin necessarily of an individual, although we all know of cases like that. We all know of a person's sinful conduct that has led directly to some kind of disease or injury or infirmity on their own. We know of such cases, but but that's not necessary at all. It was the sin of humanity that introduced death, that introduced corruption, that introduced life-taking and life-degrading disease into the world. Well, listen, a person may be sick, and I can say that it's due to sin, but it's not their sin, nor is it the sin of their parents. You could say it's the sin of Adam spread throughout the whole human race, and Jesus Christ came to give himself glory and to glorify himself by overcoming such effects. Now, in this Matthew is showing Jesus as the true Messiah. He's delivering his people from the bondage of sin and from the effects of a fallen world. I have no problem saying this, that the provision for our healing, both spiritual and physical, was made by the sufferings, the stripes of Jesus Christ. Now, the physical dimension of our healing is partially realized now, but finally it will be realized only in the resurrection. You see, there are some people who have taken this to mean, and Ella, I I can sense in your question, this is what you're concerned about, and it's a legitimate concern. Some have taken this to mean that every believer has the right, has the promise of God to perfect health right now. And if there is any lack of health, it's simply because this promise has not been claimed in faith. Now, in this thinking, great stress is laid upon the past tense of this phrase, at least as it's quoted here in uh, the passage, by his stripes we are or we were healed. And the idea is, since it is in the past tense, perfect health is God's promise and provision for every Christian at this very moment, just as much as the believer has the promise to perfect forgiveness and salvation at this moment. But um, I don't think that's seeing it accurately. Let me explain. First of all, the people who say they believe this, that absolute perfect healing is the divine right of every believer right now. Sometimes people call that the prosperity gospel. It goes under different names. But I would say this, I I don't think that most of them really believe it. You know, one prominent teacher of this prosperity gospel is a man named Kenneth Copeland. And it's recently come out that Kenneth Copeland has a pacemaker. I'll say it again. Friends, this isn't rumor. This isn't innuendo. He talks about it. Kenneth Copeland has a pacemaker. He says that God told him to receive it by faith instead of a miraculous healing for his heart problem. Look, I want to go on record. I don't think there's anything wrong with Kenneth Copeland receiving a pacemaker. Other 
than that it contradicts what he has so strongly taught for many years. That it was and is always God's will to immediately heal every believer. And if they aren't healed, it's probably because they don't have enough faith. And all this is based on this spin on Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes, we are healed. Now, the problem of this view, not even counting how terribly it contradicts the personal experience of saints in the Bible and throughout history. The problem of this verb is that it misunderstands what I would call the verb tense of both salvation and healing. We can say without reservation that perfect, total, complete healing is God's promise to every believer paid for by his stripes and the totality of Jesus' work for his people. I'm going to say this one more time. I can say that perfect, total, complete healing is God's promise to every believer in Jesus Christ paid for by his stripes and the totality of his work for us. But we must also say that it is not promised to every believer right now. Just as much as the totality of our salvation is not promised to the believer right now. Friends, I want you to think about this point because I think it's very important. The Bible says that we have been saved. That's Ephesians 2. Look, there's many passages for these ones, but I'm just giving you one verse each. We have been saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. The Bible says that we are being saved. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, that we will be saved. And friends, I don't mind for somebody to say, well, w- which is it? Have I been saved? Am I being saved? Will I be saved? And the answer to that question is yes. Now, even so, there is a sense in which spiritually and physically, believers have been healed, are being healed, and one day will be healed. And God's ultimate healing is called resurrection. And what a glorious promise that is to every believer. Listen, um, I I rejoice in God's healing work. And I think I've seen God do miraculous healings on more than one occasion, both uh, in people very close to me and in some extent in my own life as well. But look, let's be honest. Every healing that might happen to this body right now, even if it's a stone cold miracle, It's really just a patching up of a tent that's destined to fold up and will need resurrection one day. You could say that every patch up healing in this present age, it simply anticipates the ultimate healing that will come. I could put it to you this way, and these are the words here at the bottom. Spiritually and physically, Believers have been healed, are being healed, and will be healed. All are true, and all of it is by his stripes. All right, so let me just kind of get back to this. Wrap up here. Isaiah 53, 5 speaks of both spiritual and physical healing. Number two, the salvation of God's people is real. And they definitely possess it. Yet, it's not complete until the day of resurrection. And whatever healing the believer receives in this life, praise the Lord when the Lord does that, or when they receive that healing in the resurrection. Either way, it's based on the fact that by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. I think it's a good thing for Christians to pray boldly and to trust God's goodness and mercy in granting gifts of healing now, even before the ultimate healing of resurrection. I think if a believer is sick and suffering, it's entirely fair for them to cry out to God and say, Lord, heal me. Now, if God chooses to, instead of delivering them from that trial, to give them strength in the midst of the trial, they certainly can do that. God is sovereign. He knows what's best we can pray boldly and say, Lord, whether you heal me now or you heal me ultimately, thank you that by your stripes, by your suffering, 
uh, before and at the cross, that is the grounds of my healing, both spiritually and physically. I hope that's helpful for you, folks. Thank you, Ella, for that question. And uh, with that, I'm going to get on now to the uh, questions that have come in from our uh, live chat. We're going to begin with another question from our TWR audience. Uh, again, thank you, TWR. And here's a question from Leslie. Leslie asks this. Can you explain the application for Christians of the parable told by Jesus about the shrewd manager? It's a parable that's always got me wondering what Jesus was teaching and how to put it into practice. I really appreciate your ministry, by the way. Well, Leslie, thank you. And I'm happy to answer that. Now, Leslie, look, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't explain how my mind works really well. But I certainly know the parable you're referring to, the parable of the shrewd manager. But I, I couldn't tell you right off, quickly off the top of my head, which gospel it's in or which chapter. So we're not going to turn to the passage, but let me just explain it. Jesus told a parable about a man who uh, worked for a master and his master found out that the man was corrupt and stealing from him. So the master was going to fire him. So when the man found out that his master was going to fire him, what he did was he went around to everybody to whom his master owed money, and he settled their accounts uh, for pennies on the dollar. Oh, you owe my master 500 pieces of silver. Look, let's settle the bill for 50 pieces of silver, but remember the favor I did for you later. And he did this with several people to whom his master owed money. Jesus complimented the shrewd manager who was not only a thief, an embezzler, but he was managing his master's resources, very going out and settling the master's accounts for pennies on the dollar. Uh, Leslie, I don't blame you for looking at this going, Jesus, what are you talking about here? How are you putting this man forward as an example? And Leslie, I've got an answer for you. Here is the wisdom of the shrewd manager that Jesus wants us to learn by. The shrewd manager used his present position to prepare for an unknown or a potentially unpleasant future. That's it. Remember that parables really aren't out there to teach us a great detail in every aspect of theology. Rather, parables are there just to sort of give us uh, one, maybe a couple very straightforward principles. So we're not trying to draw application out of every single detail in this parable, but this is what we are getting from it. That it is wise to use your present position to prepare for a future that may seem in some ways to be uncertain and maybe insecure. Jesus applied that parable to eternity. Leslie, the wisest thing that people on the earth can do right now is use this present life to prepare for eternity. Think about how wise, how important that is. We're all going to live forever. We are all in some way immortal. We will live forever. Now, what kind of life are we going to live forever? That determines with what we do right here, right now. It is a foolish person who knows that they have something of an uncertain future in front of them, yet they do nothing to prepare for that future. So uh, I think this is a very important and a very helpful parable. Thank you for asking about that question, Leslie. All right, let's go to the next one from Sue. Sue asks, would you explain what is meant by the term praying in the spirit? And uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, we have the verse, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Jude chapter 1, verse 20. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there are some people when they see that phrase, praying in the Holy Spirit, what they immediately think of is praying in tongues, in the gift of tongues, using the gift of tongues which the Bible tells us very plainly. You know, I, 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 I just kind of can't, I kind of can't comprehend all the misunderstanding there is among God's people about the gift of tongues. I, I am sometimes shocked 
by the number of people in God's family, pe people who are well-read and good teachers, and they know a lot, yet they somehow think and act as though the purpose of the gift of tongues is to evangelize or disciple people in other languages. Where the Bible tells us so plainly, so straightforwardly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it tells us that, he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. Period. God gives the gift of tongues not to be a horizontal form of communication, but a vertical form of communication. Now, look, there's a lot to that that we could go in to the questions people have about that. But understanding that, Sue, so some people think, oh, well, then whenever it says praying in the Spirit... That means somebody praying using the gift of tongues. And I would just say simply this, that, well, it could be, but the idea of praying in the Spirit goes far beyond the gift of tongues. The idea of praying in the Spirit is directly relevant to having prayer led by, inspired by, informed by, in the flow of the Holy Spirit of God. And really, that's just what it is. It's spirit-guided prayer, spirit-inspired prayer. And, and, and that's maybe when we have our times of prayer, that's the first thing we pray for. Lord, would you guide me in this prayer by your Holy Spirit? I, I want to pray what is according to your wisdom, what is according to your will, what is according to your glory. And I think it's a valid prayer for us to pray. Praying in the Holy Spirit is praying according to the heart of God, according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Look, we understand this, don't we? That prayer fundamentally is not to get my will done, but it's to the best of our imperfect ability. It's to discern what the will of God is and to ask God to enact that, to carry that out in this world. So, Sue, that's the best way I'd say it. Prayer in the Spirit certainly can include praying in tongues. But more so, it has the idea of simply of spirit-inspired and guided prayer. Hope that's helpful for you there. Let me go on to the next question. Jesus House asks, I am often asked, did Jesus descend to hell after he died? Okay, Jesus House. Um, I'm just going to take the question the exact way that you ask it. Here are the exact words. Did Jesus descend to hell after he died? My answer to that question would be no. Now, I need to give a lot of qualification here. In Ephesians, it speaks of Jesus descending to the lower parts of the earth after his death. There are people, solid commentators, who believe that that is merely a reference to uh, Jesus being buried that's just simply it. His, his going to the lower parts of the earth is just a reference to him being buried. And that's one way that people understand that. I believe that when it speaks there of Jesus descending into the lower parts of the earth, that it's talking about Jesus going to, not to what we normally think of as hell. When people normally think of hell, what they're actually thinking of is Gehenna. They're thinking of um, the lake of fire, th this place of eternal destiny for those who have chosen to separate themselves from God and to reject God. So that's what we normally think of as hell. But the Bible tells us that people are only cast into the lake of fire, hell, Gehenna, after the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment happens only after the reign of Jesus is concluded on earth. So you could say right now, in this sense, there's nobody in hell. That's awaiting the final judgment. Now, hold on here. The Bible talks about sort of an intermediary place that people go when they die. That's called Sheol, the grave. Hades is another term for that in um, uh, the, the Greek conception. And Hades, to give a very short and imperfect description, that's the place where those who aren't in Jesus Christ go 
awaiting the final judgment. It's not a place of partying. It's not a place of pleasure. It's a place of torment. Jesus told us a story about a man who went to Hades. I don't believe it was a parable. I think it was a story. Jesus giving us an actual story. And that man who went to Hades was in torment. So I do believe that Jesus went to Hades after his death and he proclaimed liberation because before the finished work of Jesus Christ, Hades had two areas. One was a place of blessing. One was a place of of reward for the people of God. And then there was another place that was a place of torment. Jesus came and he preached deliverance to those who were in the good part of Hades, if we want to use that phrase. He preached condemnation to those who were in the bad part of Hades, the place of torment. And he led those people who were in the so-called good place of Hades or Sheol to heaven. Because he could now that the price had been paid, that the work was finished. So um, there are people, I would just say this, Jesus' house, who believe that that phrase in Ephesians, where it talks about Jesus going into the lower parts of the earth, refers only to his burial. Okay, I get that. But I would, by bringing together several passages of Scripture, I I would say that there's more to it there. And I would give it that understanding that I just gave you there. Okay, next question comes from Evie, who asks, Are we breaking the second commandment when we are looking at Jesus through pictures such as the chosen, the passion, etc. Okay, well, Evie, um, let me just say, there are some Christians who really believe so. There are some Christians who believe that any depiction of Jesus, any visual depiction of Jesus, whether it be uh, in a movie, in a painting, in a cartoon, whatever it be, any kind of visual depiction of Jesus, they would say is a breaking of the second commandment, which says that you shouldn't make any kind of image or likeness of God, and of course, Jesus being God. Now, here's the thing. I think that the real sin, uh, and I would disagree with that. I I do think that uh, understood the right way, um, a representation of Jesus can be fine, can be okay. Again, understood the right way. I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, I believe that what the second commandment forbids is making such images to worship them. If somebody worships the Jesus, uh, the the chosen Jesus, or worships that actor or that image, that's dangerous. Worshiping an image is dangerous. What we do is we confine our worship to the true Jesus who's greater than any visual representation. Even the greatest actor in the world could not adequately represent Jesus in all he is and all that he's done. So I believe that what's being condemned there in the second commandment is the making of images to worship. Now, there is some of that in the Christian world, is there not? Do not people make images of Mary or the saints or Jesus and put them in churches and people bow down and pray to them and worship them? That would be very much a violation of the second commandment. But but I believe it's possible to have a visual representation and it not be an object of worship. So, uh, Ivy, I'll just tell you that there's a, there's a divergence of opinion in the Christian world on this. There are some Christians who say, no, any visual representation of God in any way is a breaking of this commandment. Other people stress the idea of any kind of visual representation that is for the purpose or causes worship of that image or of that uh, representation. So I hope you catch the distinction I'm trying to make there, Evie. Um There's a very strong tradition in the Orthodox Christian world that because Jesus came in a very visual way, I mean, look, Jesus came as a true man that could be seen and heard and touched. And I mean, that that God sort of changed his rules with that, so to speak, that he said, now I will represent my way myself in a way that can be seen. That, that's some of the thinking, just in a super unfairly mention of it, uh, just to, to begin that. So anyway, I hope that helps you there, Evie. Let me go on to the next question here from Susan, who asks, How do you think churches can incorporate the instructions Paul gave to churches uh, in 1 Corinthians 11? 
Okay, well, 1 Corinthians 11 has things like a head covering for women, the conduct of the Lord's Supper, the institution of the Lord's Supper, examining yourself. You see, here's what we need to do, Susan. We need to take a look at these scriptures, and this is part of rightly dividing the word of truth. Taking the Bible and interpreting it correctly, fairly, and applying it correctly and fairly. And I think just what we have here is a very straightforward thing of that uh, some of the things that are instructions given, the well, let me back up here. The principle of what God said through Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth and other passages in the New Testament, that applies uh, throughout history. Absolutely it does. How that principle is carried out may differ from culture to culture. Take the whole issue of head coverings. Um, There are some people who absolutely insist that according to 1 Corinthians 11, that Christian women in the gatherings of worship, they should wear head coverings. Here's what I think that they're missing. They're missing the fact that in Corinthian culture, in Roman culture, in that part of the world at that time, a head covering meant something. If you saw a woman with a head covering, you properly assumed something about that woman. Just as much as you would see a man or a woman today with a wedding ring and you assume something about them properly. You assumed that a woman with a head covering in that culture was under authority. Now, a head covering in our culture today doesn't have that connotation at all. So the principle, the purpose behind it, that women in a congregation should demonstrate that they are under the authority of qualified men, not every man in the church, but the qualified men in the church who are called and and, and called to lead, that principle abides. How they show that principle, well, that can change according to cultural expression. Now, I know that there are people who get all wound up about this. Oh, you don't believe the Bible. Oh, you think it's all cultural. Listen, for those folks, I would just have simply this. Are you kissing in your church services? There are more commands in the New Testament to greet one another with a holy kiss than there are to wear a head covering in church. Now, you you say that, well, no, 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 We, we understand. Paul didn't mean that you have to literally kiss other people in church. He, he meant greet one another with a warm greeting. And I do that with a kind word. I do that with a handshake. I do that with a hand on the shoulder. I don't have to kiss the guy, uh, you know, next to me. No, 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 no. You, you see the point I'm trying to make here. We all get it when it applies to the holy kiss. The same principle applies to head coverings. So these things in principle are definitely carried out. Uh, the way we should conduct ourselves at the Lord's Supper. Uh, the way we should institute this, these things should be carried out in church today, but in principle, not necessarily towards the way that principle was expressed in ancient culture. Uh, you know, look, if we're going to get all ancient on this and everybody should show up to church next week with a toga and sandals and, you know, uh, bring a couple slaves with you because they were part of the New Testament church, on and on and on. We understand According to culture, these things change, but the principles remain and should be honored. So, Susan, I hope that's helpful for you. Let me go on to the next question. Uh, Tunal Banan Shugotre asks, Hello from Sweden. Who will hear God say, uh, depart from me on Judgment Day? Well, Tunal Banan Shugotre you know, I, I, I can't say in every regard. I, I can give some general principles. Certainly, everyone who has rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be there. Maybe that's the safest way to say. But, you know, um, we all have this tendency to want to make salvation a matter of what group you belong to or to make damnation a matter of what group you belong to. And friends, I'm, I'm just here to tell you that God deals with each soul individually. And those that have rejected Jesus Christ, rejected the good news, 
those who have looked to self or to some ceremony, or I could go on and on, they've looked to anywhere but Jesus. Those people will hear on that day, depart from me. So it's a heavy thing. The day of judgment is real. And without getting into specifics, oh, this group, this person, this, I'll just say, all those who have consciously rejected Jesus Christ, they will certainly be told to depart from Jesus on Judgment Day. I'm not saying that that is limited to that, but maybe it would take much longer than we can do to go beyond that. Thank you for your question on that. Next question comes from Ibn Ha'ezer, who asks, what is the connection between conscience and the Holy Spirit? How are we to differentiate the voice of the Spirit with the voice of our own conscience? Are we transforming or Correct, connecting our conscience with the Holy Spirit now as believers. Ibn Ha'etzer, those are great questions. And it can, it, it can sometimes be confusing. Let me just put it to you that way, but straightforward. Um, if I am convicted of a sin, David, you shouldn't do that. David, that's wrong. Is that conviction coming from the Holy Spirit? Or is that conviction coming from my conscience? I think many times one wouldn't know. Now, here's the thing about our conscience. Our conscience is a gift from God telling us right from wrong. But like everything else in the human being, it's been affected by the fall. So we can't rest on the authority of our conscience alone. No, 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 that will not do. We have to take rest, take peace in the fact that the Holy Spirit can help our conscience. The Bible talks about people who have a seared conscience, uh, a, a conscience that's overactive, uh, an accused conscience. The conscience can be imperfect. But of course, the Holy Spirit is not imperfect, though we don't have a perfect ability to hear from the Spirit of God. So I would just put it to you that way, that um, sometimes the voice of our conscience can seem very similar to us to what the Holy Spirit would say. And let me say, when that's true, praise the Lord. And I don't know, but if we can uh, discern all the time, oh, this was my conscience, this was the Holy Spirit, other than just to recognize that even though the conscience is a gift from God, it's not perfect. And it can be affected by the fall. It, it is possible for a person to have a seared or burned over conscience and their conscience approves them just fine, but the Holy Spirit of God does not. So uh, it's a challenging thing. Uh, that's a great thing for us to do. Not, I would say that if you want to help your conscience any way you can, you need to spend as much time in God's word as you can. Remember that phrasing from Romans that we must be re, uh, transformed by the renewing of our mind. And really, that's what we're looking for, the renewing of our mind. Okay, I see we're coming up to our lightning round. All right, this is where we're going to try to answer a lot of questions and answer them fast, perhaps incompletely, but we'll do the very best we can. I think we're going to need to take a drink of water here before we hit the lightning round. Jason asks, David, what's your view on prophetic healers, seeing people get touched and automatically being healed? Uh, Jason, uh, much of it is fakery, but not all of it. A and sometimes God will use ridiculous instruments out of his own mercy and grace. So uh, I think it's valid to be skeptical of such sort of prophetic healers, uh, but to recognize that nevertheless, God can still even use a foolish and imperfect instrument. Um, we should be wary of those who seem to bring glory to themselves in the work that they claim God is doing. That's number one. Uh, number two, Joshua asks, uh, does God know our individual needs and struggles? Joshua, yes, he does. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that God knows the number of the hairs on your head. Now, that's an easier number for God to calculate for me in recent years. 
but uh, God knows the number of hairs on our heads. He knows everything about us. And yes, he knows our needs and our struggles. Remember, Joshua, that the Bible invites us to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. The Bible tells us that we should be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make our requests known to God. So yes, Joshua, God knows our individual needs and struggles, yet he wants us to bring them to him in a conscious act of faith, saying, I yield this to you, Lord God. Uh, Lucho asks, how would you answer to a person who says that all pastors in the Sixers had to be Masons? Uh, Lucho, I would say that's absolutely false. Uh, Perhaps it was more common for pastors in the 1960s to be Masons, but it's just absolutely not true that all pastors in the 1960s had to be Masons. Again, I know people who were pastoring, although that's a long time ago, in the 1960s, uh, either now or they've passed on to be with the Lord, and I knew them earlier in my life, and they were not Masons. So it's just not true. Interesting question, though. Alfredo asks, is Mary the new Eve and the Ark of the New Covenant? Um, Alfredo, I would say no. Because Jesus is the new Adam, the second Adam. But Eve was Adam's wife. And Mary is not Jesus's wife. That's the body of Christ. If Eve corresponds to anybody, it's the body of Christ. Uh, So, no, I I would not say that Mary's the new Eve, nor would I say that she's the Ark of the Covenant, even though somebody would say, well, she, she contained the glory of God within her as the Ark of the Covenant did. But again, I, I think that that's just a, a inaccurate and probably a uh, over-glorifying to Mary approach. Look, we honor Mary as a great woman of God, but she wasn't sinlessly perfect. Uh, she wasn't immaculately conceived. Uh, she needed a Savior just like anybody else. And what we should do with Mary is we should listen to what she said to the servants at the wedding at Cana. She told the servants there at the wedding, Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. That's a great word from Mary. Okay, next question comes from Andromeda. Is it biblical to make promises to God? What is the purpose? Is a prayer more efficient if we do it? Um, Andromeda, yes, making vows or promises to God is something that the Bible definitely talks about. Uh, So, What the Bible says is that we shouldn't make hasty promises to God. We shouldn't make hasty vows to God. And uh, I think it's helpful for every Christian. Let me go back to a book here on my bookshelf. Uh, There's a wonderful book that we've been able to republish called Full Surrender by the late Dr. J. Edwin Orr. Uh, This book, Full Surrender by the late Dr. J. Edwin Orr, was a marvelous book, um, really about discipleship, about God's work in us. And his first chapter in this book is all about broken vows. And basically, he talks about the fact that Christians today often don't regard it as a sin, as something to deal with when they make a vow to God, but they break it. He says, that's a sin you got to repent of. And God is gracious. God will forgive. But but you, you consciously made that sin. You failed to fulfill it. You, you need to repent. And, and that's just what I would say to anybody who has broken a vow to God. Um, what, what we need to avoid, Andromeda, when it comes to the idea of making a vow to God, is we need to avoid the idea that it somehow twists God's arm, that it kind of makes him do something that he's reluctant to do. But a vow can be a valid demonstration of our own seriousness to God's work, to our own seriousness with what we want God to do, So there is a place for uh, vows, um, but we do need to be careful with them before the Lord, not as a way to try to force God to do what we want him to do. Hope that's helpful for you there, Andromeda. Next question in our lightning round comes from Horatio, who asks, what does Jesus mean uh, generated in eternity, but not created? Okay, Horatio, uh, you're talking about this creedal formation talking about the deity of Jesus that says that he was begotten 
or generated in eternity, but he wasn't created. Um, the relationship between God the Father and God the Son is not a relationship between creator and created, but it's a relationship between begetter and begotten. And, and here's the thing about uh, the relationship of begetting. I, I could create a statue that looks very much like myself. Well, if I had the artistic ability, I could do it. And what a waste of time that would be. Who wants a statue that would look just like me? But at least theoretically, it's possible for somebody to make a statue that looks exactly like themselves, but it wouldn't be human. It would be whatever material they made it out of. Now, a son or daughter of mine is my offspring. I've begotten them and they are 100% human. In the same way, God the Son, his relationship to God the Father is described as begotten, indicating for us that he is 100% divine being as God the Father is. Now, there's other places in the scripture which speak to the eternal nature of the Son. I believe it's in Micah that describes his, his going forths are of old, even unto everlasting. So uh, that's something that needs to be kept in mind. Because we're not trying to say that Jesus begotten, that he necessarily had a beginning point. He's eternal. But what we are saying is that he is fully and completely God. Um, so uh, we don't want to fall into that Arian trap of saying that Jesus is not eternal, but that he's a created being. Arianism basically taught much as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, otherwise known as the Jehovah's Witnesses teach today. They taught that uh, Jesus was the first and greatest of God the Father's creation, but he was nevertheless still a creation. That is not biblical. It's not true. Hope that's helpful for you there, Horatio. Next question, is faith without works dead? Yes. Let me explain to you why, though. Uh, faith without works is not a living faith. Dead faith can't save anybody. We're, we're saved by faith alone, but what James addresses in his letter, and that's where that phrase comes from that you're quoting there, J.L., uh, the faith that saves is a living faith. It's not a faith just of words or ideas, but it's a faith that will carry itself out into real action that honors and glorifies God. Yes, faith without works is dead, and dead faith won't save anyone. Uh, Dan asks, do you have any thoughts on the Satan con in Boston? Is it just showing how far this country is falling away from the truth? Well, Dan, I really don't know anything about the Satan Con, but it sounds to me like it's a convention of Satanists. And um, those losers will get their own reward. L listen, Satan loves to posture and present himself as the ultimate winner. Ladies and gentlemen, Satan's a loser. And anybody who consciously follows Satan is a loser. Jesus Christ has and will win his victory. Satan took his best shot at him. And uh, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So uh, I think it is an indication of how greatly our nation, how greatly our culture is turning away from God. And there will be a price to be paid for that. Absolutely, positively, there will. So uh, yeah, it's a discouraging sign of the times. All right. Seeing if anything else comes in on the uh, question line lightning round. Maybe I'm answering the questions faster than our moderator can send them to me. Uh, maybe I'm not answering them completely enough. All right. Well, uh, final question comes from DS. Here we go. Ready? Do you consider Calvinism a heresy in the sense of God determining the unelect to be predestined to hell as God intentionally sending those people to hell? Is this a heresy? All right, DS, I'm happy to answer the question, but we need to define terms a little bit. Let me tell you what I mean by heresy. What I mean by heresy is not just a teaching that's false, something that's not true according to the scriptures, uh, but something that if it is believed, you're going to hell. To me, heresy is more than just a wrong teaching. So I believe that a teaching can be wrong without being heretical. Okay, th those are my terms. Now, do I think you're kind of referring to the idea of double predestination? First of all, 
not every Calvinist or Reformed theologian believes in double predestination. But um, double predestination is wrong, in my view. I, I think the scriptures just nowhere teach the idea that God has predestined the damned to be damned. And that there's you know, no conceivable thing. It's just, that's all there is. They're predestined to be damned. Just as much as he's predestined his own people, his elect to receive salvation. So I believe that idea of double predestination is wrong. It's a false teaching. The Bible does not teach that. Uh, but I, I don't even know that I would regard it as a heresy in the way that I'm defining heresy. Now, D.S., maybe you define heresy as just a false teaching or maybe a bad false teaching. Well, I mean, then, you know, you and I could have a talk about that. But as wrong as the teaching of double predestination is, I don't think it's the kind of thing that if a person believes that, they're automatically going to hell. So that's the way I would answer that for you, D.S. Folks, that's going to wrap it up here for today's program. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank our moderator. I want to thank everybody of you who've done the whole Enduring Word team. I want to thank our subscribers. And of course, you guys can always click the subscribe and like button. What I really pray for you is that you have a blessed Good Friday and a blessed Resurrection Weekend, Easter Sunday, whatever you want to call it, the day we remember that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I gave my life to Jesus Christ when I was 13 years old on an Easter Sunday. I'll never forget it. A man named Greg Laurie was preaching. It happened at a service of Calvary Chapel of Riverside, which was the name of that church before they changed the name to Harvest. I'm so grateful for not only uh, bringing the gift of salvation to me through that ministry, but also for how it's made a pattern on me in ministry since. So Easter's a special day for me. I hope it's a special day for you. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's live in the glory and the goodness of his resurrection power. Next week, I'm going to be doing it on Thursday, but we are going to be on the road. And I want you to know, I do believe, well, I don't know. I'm considering moving the Q&A to Wednesday. Uh, so maybe we'll do that in the future. Stay posted for that. I'll let you know if we do make that change. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, pray that you can join us next time. Thank you so much. God bless you.